On this episode of Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered, we talk about the class action lawsuits, what you need to be doing, what to expect, and what you need to plan to implement today. Going to be an incredible show. Tune in. You talk about it privately. We talk about it publicly. This is the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered podcast. Welcome back to Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered. I'm your host, James Dwiggins, along with my co-host, Keith Robinson, aka yeah. Crazy Uncle Keith. Yes, sir. So, yes. Keith, tell mm. us about the guests today. It's these two idiots. It's you these see, two you're in idiots. Front of you. They're here yeah. in your ear holes. Yeah, All we're right. doing. A, we should do like a special alert sounder, or have Merlin and the rest of the team do like special edition graphics, yeah. or something like that. Because yeah, this is just you and me on a topic that's right on a topic that we are both <laughs> frustrated that our industry isn't talking about more so let's start with that by yeah. the way before we dive into this um for show sure. we're 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 going to talk about the class action lawsuits uh which surprisingly Keith and I are still stunned at how many people are not aware Keith you were at an event yesterday yeah. I tell us, tell, tell the event. viewers and listeners on this one. This is yeah. not funny, by the way. 48 hours ago, I stood on stage in front of 150 real estate professionals from all different brands and said, how many of you know anything about the class action lawsuits? And <clears throat> four hands went up. Oh, God. And I said, out of 150. And then I said, cool, tell me a little bit about it. And all of a sudden, all the hands went down. Yeah. So only four people were brave enough to admit that they'd even heard of it. And no one had a, not one single person other than myself had a functional knowledge about what this meant and what it could mean for the industry and, and how to approach their business differently in the future. Well, and, and adding to that, so I've been on the road, what seems like my entire life recently, <laughs> uh, going to every real estate conference possible. And it, it amazes me how much of the leadership, um, in this, this industry doesn't understand it, isn't taking it seriously, or isn't aware of it as well. And I'm not talking small companies. I'm talking big companies yeah. um, where they're just like, ah, it's a nothing burger moving on with my day. And I'm like, really? Because this is going to be some pretty interesting stuff. Now, it's not sky's falling thing, but yeah. it's there's going to be changes coming. And if you're not prepared, it, it's going to be a pretty abrupt shock. Um, when this stuff happens. So yeah, you could debate what's going to happen. Right? Sure. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But what you can't debate and no one is saying is change isn't going to happen. No yeah. one is saying there will be no change at the end of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so spending some time and energy, you and I talking about it, we felt like for our listeners, it'd be good value. Because uh, candidly, uh, James is being humble here, maybe for the first time ever. Uh, he's <laughs> he's become sort of the one of the go to industry experts on this topic. You all jokes aside, you spend a tremendous amount of energy and effort to make sure that uh, you you've had the conversations, you've read documents, you've dug deep on this so that you can position uh our company and other companies in the right place. And you've become one of the de facto experts on this through the conversations that you've had. Thank you. I appreciate that. I do, you know, I do want to shout out to some people we've mm -hmm. had uh, Rob on our show before, who is our, you know, one of the people we talked to. Uh -huh. I love Rob dearly. He thinks the apocalypse is coming. That's okay. That's Rob. usually, usually. Um, well, there's like Ed Zorn, great, great lawyer. Um, I've had conversations with a former FTC lawyer. I've got a whole bunch of people I've been talking to. So a lot of what I'm going to share today and what Keith and I are going to go over um, is, is from a lot of very, uh, very in the know people who are following these cases, talking to lawyers, representing defendants, like all the way around. So our, our goal with this show is to basically give you guys uh, uh, sort of an understanding of what this is and what, what we think the potential outcome will be. And more importantly, which is the point of this, is to tell you how to prepare uh, so that you can share this pod with whoever you'd like um, and have a, a go-to strategy that we've you know candidly deployed in our organization. And mm -hmm. we feel the industry needs to um, wake up and start, you know, preparing for some of these things. I want to start before we jump in, because I know Keith wants to ask a lot of questions. Yep. Number one, Neither Keith or I are your lawyers. Nope. Uh, you can contact your own lawyer if you want to get legal advice. We're not your CPA. 
I, I also wanted to state that we, while we we're going to go through our opinions on these outcomes, we are rooting for the National Association of Realtors and the current defendants to win. They are, mm -hmm. you know, NER is certainly going to be going to trial. It seems like in October, I wanted to just start that we've been in, you know, I've been in communications with Katie Johnson and others. We're rooting for them. That being said, our position has always been hope is not a strategy. Mm -hmm. So the point of this is to give some insight and then what we think will occur and then how to plan accordingly. So yeah, one more hedge on that. that too. If you're an agent listening, we're not your broker. Yeah. Uh, talk to your broker. Neither, neither of us have a broker's license. Uh, so you don't work for us. You work for someone else. Uh, feel free to share this with your broker. Feel free to have a conversation with your broker. Uh, but if your broker disagrees with us, listen to your broker. You work for them, not for us. Yeah. Okay, All right. Let's cool. dive let's, in. Let's start from the top. Let's just give us a five minute and I'm going to hold you to five minutes. Yeah. It, it's nearly impossible, but do your yeah. best to give us the Reader's Digest version. I just dated myself. Uh, Reader's Digest, for those of you listening, uh, used to be this stupid little book. Oh, that Jesus, got move on. Never yeah, mind. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah. So five-minute overview on the three class action lawsuits and go. Yeah, so there's there's three class action lawsuits. Some five-minute countdown goes. These okay. have all been Starting filed now. several years ago. Uh, the gist of it is that they're all very similar in, uh, in plaintiff's uh, accusations, that sellers were being forced to pay for the buyer's agent's compensation on a deal due to the structure of how our industry operates. So these classes, uh, there's there's three different cases. You have Burnett Sisser versus NAR as a defendant anywhere, Keller Williams, Remax, and Home Services of America. You know them as Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you also have Morell versus NAR anywhere, Keller Williams, Remax, Home Services, um, and, and then the third one, which, um, is called, uh, Novasec, 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 excuse me, versus MLS pin. It's a very strange name. Um, and that is, uh, against anywhere Keller Williams, Remax, and again, home services. NAR is not a defendant in that last case because that MLS is not governed by the national association of realtors. The previous two I mentioned, Morell and Burnett, those MLSs, uh, that are in in this are governed by um, uh, are, no. are governed by NER, and so NER is named as a defendant in these cases. Two things: Burnett versus Sisser is uh, Burnett and Sisser versus NER is a class action case in the state of Missouri. It goes to trial, currently scheduled for October sixteenth of as in next month. Um, that is the first one that goes to trial. Morell is the larger of all of the cases. This is in twenty markets across the United States. That is currently in the process of being scheduled to go to trial. We think that will occur sometime in Q2 of next year. Um, so the first case that's coming up in October is the major one. I'm going to wrap with one thing so everybody understands what this is. And then, Keith, I know you've got more questions. Mm -hmm. the, what they are claiming is that our industry has strategically propped up compensation in the business based upon a few different things. Number one. The National Association of Realtors has essentially governance over a majority of MLSs in the United States. So their policies that they set govern the policies of local MLSs. Again, most of them are governed by NER. Number two, in the MLS, you've had to offer cooperation on the other side of the deal to the buyer's agent. Now, it could have been a dollar, to be clear, but the requirement that you have to offer cooperation is one of the, quote, conspiracies that plaintiff is claiming. The third is that when we enacted CCP, clear cooperation policy, which was done in 2020, essentially you cannot have be a member of the MLS and have a listing and not put it in the MLS within 24 hours. What that conspiracy is, is that if you're, if you're a member, you get a listing, you're required to put it in within 24 hours, you're now guaranteeing cooperation on the other side of the deal because the MLS requires you to provide cooperation. So that is part of the conspiracy. And the fourth is they're using, which I think is completely nuts, is that in the United States, we charge on average double what any other developed country around the world charges for a real estate transaction. The, why the defendants are the major franchisors is they represent about 40 to 50% of all realtors in the U.S. So if the, the conspiracy is 
you know, these defendants benefit from a policy where you're required to offer cooperation in the MLS because it, you know, 40 to 50% of the time, one of their agents is going to be on the buy side of the transaction. Keith, I'll stop there and see if you've got questions. First of all, you did that in under four minutes. So Damn, very well I'm done. I'm good. I'm you good. That's solid. That solid work. Uh, I also think one piece to add to that is the other reason those <laughs> folks were named is yes, because they're 40 to 50% of transactions. They also have deep pockets, right? Yeah, I mean, they thought they had deep pockets. That's debatable. I mean, sure. we'll, we'll go through this a little well, bit. Deeper than others. That, that is true. <laughs> and certainly in, in the real estate industry today, brokerages are broke. So right. like they, they have the deepest pockets out of the, out of the group. That is a true yep. statement. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about the headlines recently. So Anywhere yeah. and Remax have both settled two of the three cases. Do you think other defendants will settle? Yes, I do. Um, it And this is where I think we'll go a little bit deeper. So in an antitrust claim, if you lose in an antitrust claims, which is in federal court, you can also have what they call treble damages applied. So whatever the outcome is, let's say I'm making up a number, but it's $100 million, they can apply treble damages. So essentially it's $300 million worth of damages. If you are familiar with these cases, you've heard all of this stuff about you know, $30 billion and $50 billion and $10 billion settlement amounts, et cetera, that, that, that potential damages could be. I've always said this kind of like hogwash. And the reason is these companies don't have that kind of cash. Right. And there isn't a lawyer on the planet who, that I'm aware of who wants to take a case like this and then not get paid. The whole right. point of lawyers <laughs> filing suits is to get paid and then obviously supply money to the plaintiffs. So you're going to hear a lot of people talking about damages. You're going to hear people talk about how, oh, this is going to take three to five years to play out. Two comments. Number one is these cases were filed in 2019 and 2020. It's 2023. It's already been three years in many cases to get where we are. And while the damages portion could be appealed, depending upon how these trials go, that could take time. We're going to get to this. That's not the part that's actually the concerning part. Like that's mm -hmm. going to work itself out. To your question, anywhere and Remax have both settled. Anywhere's last cast position that I noticed was around 170 million in the bank. They settled these cases, two of the three, by the way, there's still one out there. Um, for about $83.5 million, let's just say roughly 40%. Um, first, to, first to settle always gets the best deal. Um, and then uh, Remax just settled for $55 million. They had about $96 million in the bank. So they were, you know, over 50% of their cash base was, was done on these settlements. Um, do I think that Berkshire or Home Services and uh, Keller Williams will settle? Absolutely. Um, these cases against the industry are very strong. For the plaintiffs, um, the franchisors had the best ability to defend these cases, ironically, even more than NER did. Um, and the fact that they're settling shows that they're, you know, they're they're concerned about essentially what the outcome of this would be. Um, if there is damages that exceed the company's cash base, then there is bankruptcy. That is a that is a realistic opportunity. I don't think that's the reality based upon what plaintiffs have shown. They're interested in settling these cases as well. They're they're hovering around 50% of the company's assets and, and from a cash perspective is where they've been able to settle with it. Um, so I do think you'll see Keller and Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway settle next. I do. We should also note that we haven't read, or at least I haven't, and I don't think you have. I don't think it's been released yet. The the actual settlement statement. That it's not been released. There. Until so, plaintiff files it formally with the judge, They the information of that settlement is not out there. We have inclinations of what some of these things are, such as franchisors will, will, will no longer require agents to be a, a member of NAR. Um, I, that's a given. Uh, but as you'll hear us talk about it in a minute, I don't think that's going to destroy NER. And certainly I don't I hope the industry doesn't try to because there's going to be some important steps NER will take, I think, um, shortly to help the industry get past all of this. So. Yeah, but we, we are there's a fair amount of assumption here. We'll do another one of these as we get more clarity. Yeah, but people but need to be paying attention. They do. Yeah. And I, I want to add two comments. So it, it is also an assumption, but it is a very logical assumption mm -hmm. that they in these settlements, they've opened the class. I want to make sure everybody understands what this means. So if you're being sued in 20 markets plus Missouri, it's, let's just say 21 markets for simple math, and you settle the cases out and you don't open the class to the rest of the US, you're subjecting yourself to further litigation, meaning 
people in other markets could potentially sue you. Now, there's a chance that wouldn't happen because if you just settled out and you gave all the money you had, you'd have to find a lawyer to represent a new class of plaintiffs that would want to take it. That's pretty unlikely based upon what they've already done. But it would make logical sense the lawyers representing defendants would open the class, meaning we're not going to settle with you unless you bring everybody into the case so that we're limiting our liability. So yeah, for this would close the door. Correct. On this issue. Correct. And, and yeah. it's a five year statute of limitations on these cases. So what I want to make sure everybody understands is let's say that there's, you know, we'll use anywhere's number of eighty three and a half million dollars instead of the people in those 20 markets plus Missouri getting access to that money. It's everybody across the U.S. So the amount of money that someone gets is going to shrink, but it limits your liability. So. Yep. It's important right. what I'm what I'm sharing because as you're <clears throat> going to hear me talk about why I'm going to emphasize that NAR needs to settle this these cases. This is going to be important for how we move on as an industry. So, well, it's a good segue to the next question. So, yeah. what is NAR's position on all this? So, look, they they are in the position of, of stating that we have the best system for providing exposure to listings, the MLS. We do, by the way, I don't know if most people mm -hmm. don't know this, but there aren't MLSs in most other countries. We Correct. operate very differently here than um, the rest of the world. It is, in my opinion, the best system for making sure that seller has, has their property exposed to as many people as possible. Um, and NAR is basically stating that it has always been negotiable, which is true. Um, and that, you know, the system that we have in place, I'm really simplifying here. There's nothing wrong with what it is. And there is no conspiracy. I do agree with NER. I don't think there's some massive conspiracy going on. That's just not how this industry operates. But that being said, if you look at the pieces on the table and the fact that this is going to a trial of People who uh, have not owned a house, by the way, that's a stipulation. You, you can't be a homeowner and be on the on the jury. Um, so you, you're gonna you're you're talking about you, you're talking about people that aren't as educated about the the, the way this industry operates. Then mm -hmm. plaintiffs gonna lay out their case of all of those things I mentioned about governance, MLS requirements, CCP, et cetera. Our defense is gonna be we're gonna struggle with it. I'm not saying that we will lose, but I am I am in the camp that. I don't think we have a good chance at winning these cases. Every single thing we've done to date as an industry has been tossed by the judge. Everything. Like it's it's literally been no, no, no. And now we're going to a jury trial. I think we have a very low chance of winning it. Again, I'm rooting for NER. But my opinion is there's more harm at this point in continuing this with potential, you know, actually losing. And then it's damages times three than there is of trying to find a way to settle this out. So, all right. We're NAR's get... position is they're going to go to trial, by the way. I didn't answer yeah. the question. Yeah. They're going to trial in October. As of today, I still think there's a chance this will settle. So, yeah. okay. A couple more technical ones, and then we're going to get into best case scenario, most likely scenario, and what to work on going forward. But a couple more technical questions because they're important and they're things that are <laughs> often missed. Let's talk about the potential injunction, injunction that the plaintiff is requesting. Yeah. That's a docket item that's out there right now. Correct. So this is the part that everyone's not paying attention to and why we're doing this. It, the, the damages is one piece of the puzzle. And, and certainly, it, you know, it's a concerning piece. The other piece of the puzzle is the fact that this is federal court. So we're in federal court in Missouri next month. That judge, he can if he so chooses, based upon the outcome of this, decide that he wants to give plaintiff's request of an injunction and put it in place. That injunction basically means that cooperation in the MLS stops, meaning it's no longer happening in the MLS. How the judge decides to interpret that is up to him. Um, he could make it be so that it's optional, so that essentially you could not offer compensation in the MLS, or he could go all the way to the extent of basically banning cooperation in the MLS, saying that this is harming consumers. And this is the, the other caveat. He could go as far as banning it, not only in the state of Missouri, where this is being tried, but also federally. In other words, he could say cooperation in the MLS is done. 
across all 50 states. You've seen this, by the way, with all the politics of a federal judge enacting some sort of injunction or ban with the political side of things. Same thing could apply here. I'm betting 50-50 yeah. that that happens mm -hmm. on the outright ban. Um, I do think... I do think the judge will, uh, this is my speculation from talking to lawyers, will will absolutely require MLSs to make it optional. Um, in other words, going from a dollar to zero. But that is happening and could happen as early as October for a decision. And then there'll be a time frame to implement. Some people say as much as six months, anywhere from 90 days to six months potentially could be the time frame. So and an injunction, just, to, just in case people aren't familiar, it just is... Uh, basically, the plaintiff saying, let's halt this damaging process while we're figuring everything else out. And so if that were the case, that is where the judge could then do the things that James is talking about. Correct. So the, the plaintiff is saying, hey, judge, these people are being damaged. Make sure it, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. Yeah. And then while we go through trial and do the other stuff. Yeah. So and this is really important part because, you know, what, why we're trying to make people aware of this is some of this stuff can happen very quickly. And our, yeah, it's a really wholly unprepared. It's a really common refrain, you know, yeah, okay, I've heard about it, but I'll worry about that in six years when we're done with appeals. Well, that won't be so the case. nothing to do with it. The, yeah. Correct. If there's an injunction, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Correct. All right. This is another common misconception. Uh, unpack for us the DOJ, how they're involved in the FTC. How are the DOJ and the FTC involved in all of this? Yeah. So I'm going to give a little bit of a timeline because you heard a lot about the Department of Justice investigating NAR. I want to be sure everybody understands this. These are two separate things. You have the civil cases that are occurring, these class action cases, nothing to do with the DOJ. That's completely separate and apart from it. The Department of Justice um, held a, a joint workshop on competition in real estate. And this was in June of, of 2018. Um, in the summer, later that summer, the DOJ decides to open an investigation on NER regarding their MLS rules. So you're looking at you know, how this cooperation policy works. By the way, the DOJ does this about every 10 years. <laughs> so in 2008, they, they, there was a settlement between NAR and the DOJ. That settlement was in place for 10 years. 2018, the settlement's done, and now they open up an investigation again. Um, November 2020, uh, uh, the DOJ and NAR settled the investigation of the commission um, and essentially what they call the CCP rule. So that's clear cooperation policy. So we enacted the clear cooperation policy in 2020 as well. Uh, the DOJ in May of 2021 backs out of the settlement, which has never been heard of before. I want to be clear ever. with the statement, yeah. ever. Change in administration, settlement was done, new administration comes in. I'm not being political, I'm being factual with this, by the way, as you're going to hear some of this stuff. The new administration comes in and says, no, 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 we don't want to do that deal anymore. They back out of the settlement uh, and decides to continue its investigation of the commission and CCP rules. Um, then in the summer 2021, super important. Uh, Anti-competition in buying and selling homes, the Cato Institute releases a report. We will have this in our description. You will be able to read it. It's a very fascinating study, um, ironically, from a libertarian think tank, actually saying that we need to have more governance. A little bit of a weird backwards philosophy. <laughs> First uh, time ever. The quote that's most important, the most problematic of these rules is the requirement that sellers predetermine before even knowing the buyer, the commission paid to the buyer's agent. This constitutes a, quote, time practice, which fixes brokerage prices and stifles competition for the consumer. Now, I do not agree with this term of tying. That's not how this works. But this is what the Cato Institute put out. This is the most important part. So the DOJ backed out of the settlement. NAR sued them for backing out of the deal and won. They had to follow the terms of the settlement. The DOJ is now appealing that process. That's happening over here. What was not party to the settlement was the Federal Trade Commission. This is super important what I'm about to tell everybody. So the FTC is sitting on the sidelines. They're not privy, they're not part of the settlement between NER and the DOJ. And I want to make sure you, you all hear this and, and see this. July 9th of 2021, Biden signs an executive order called the Ameri uh, the Promoting Competition in America Economy Plan. Section 5, further agency responsibilities. I'm going to read this because this is super important. Uh, subsection H, to address persistent and reoccurrent practices that inhibit competition, the chair of the FTC and the chair's discretion is also encouraged to consider working with the rest of the commission 
to exercise the FTC's statutory rulemaking authority, subsection six, unfair time practices or exclusionary there's that, practices. There's that word again. In the brokerage or listing of real estate. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. Mm -hmm. The Federal Trade Commission has been given under an executive order from the president, the administration, to have complete discretionary authority to rewrite the rules where it deems this time practice is occurring. And they're re directly referencing the, the Cato Institute report. Why this is important for everybody to understand is as Keith and I are going to go deeper into this. Even if we won these cases under the current policies that are in place, it is very likely the Federal Trade Commission will come in if they don't like the way the civil cases are going and will rewrite the rules anyway. In <laughs> other words, minimum making compensation in the MLS optional, what we believe will be further as an outright ban on cooperation in the MLS. So what I want to make sure everybody understands, politically, the FTC is sitting on the sidelines because why create a political hot mess if you've got these civil cases going and let the courts determine the outcome of it? But if the courts don't get the outcome or the, the outcome doesn't occur that the FTC wants, they've already have the discretion and authority to go in and rewrite the rules as it is. This, my point, what I'm trying to get at, compensation in, in, inside the MLS, in my opinion, is done. It's simply a matter of when it's done. Is it through these civil cases? Is it through another investigation? Is it through the FTC? All signals are pointing to the way that we currently operate the business and the way that we share in compensation and transparency is coming to an end. My opinion, my opinion. So, okay. Whew, so that's news, right? Um, now let's just take a breath and try to talk about what, what's going to, we now have the framework in the landscape. What do you think is, we won't go worst case that there's enough of that being published out there. Yeah. Uh, whatever. You know, worst it's not case, reality. Yeah. Okay. Worst case y'all, the world's over. Right. And it's not a reality. dead. And that's worst case scenario. Not going to happen. We think it's very unlikely. So what is a likely scenario? And then what do you think is the best case scenario for potential outcomes? Okay. I'll go, let me go best first. Okay. We win. Yep. Um, and you see all cooperation in the MLS become optional. Mm -hmm. That's already happening. I'm sure people who are listening to this podcast have already seen changes. I'm, I'm getting notices from everybody. The MLS is putting notices yeah. out. You can put in zero now instead of you know a dollar, a dollar. or, or yeah. whatever. So I've gotten at um, least six. Yeah, updates me from too. Folks. Yeah. So I think you'll see that NAR is obviously pushing that down. MLSs will continue to do that. I think unfortunately you'll see MLSs pull away from being governed by NAR. Um, I'm not saying unfortunately that may be a good thing. I'm kind of mixed on that still, but they don't want the liability of this potential problem in the future. So I do believe you will see in time, most MLSs pull back from NER governance. I think that opens up a whole can of worms, which is for a whole separate podcast, <laughs> but, um, that's really the best case scenario is, is we win these cases. I think everything goes optional in the MLS and candidly, we continue on pretty much like we always have. You might see some changes in you know the way agents get compensated but that's nothing new we've been doing it for a long time anyway so i and i think that's best best how likely an outcome is that do you think i think that's less than five percent okay so very unlikely but that is the best case scenario what do you think is the most likely scenario so a high percentage chance that it ends this way yeah so the likely scenario again you know i'm i hope i'm sure. wrong <laughs> yeah and, um yeah th I this think is this is, uh, you know, two two guys, but really one guy's opinion, right? Like, I yeah, mean, I mean, this... it's mine plus a lot of lawyers. In fairness, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I, I I would say that our opinion is more educated than most, based upon Agreed. what we're seeing and what we're doing, and we've been right so far. So, mm -hmm. um, everyone settles. Uh, you see, anywhere in Berkshire settle, as I mentioned, uh, you'll get actually a clue into their finances because we know plaintiff won't take less than 50%. So like you're going to get some insights. These companies aren't publicly traded, so you don't know what they have financially, but they'll settle out. I think NER settles. It's either before this trial in October. And if they lose in October, they absolutely will, will go in for global settlement. It's important that they do in my opinion. And here's why NER will likely do a settlement and they say, okay, we're going to we're going to pay money to get these cases to go away. 
Really important one about to tell you, NER will likely, if they're smart, and they are, and I'm sure the plaintiff will agree to it, say, we want to pull in all NER members into the settlement. This mm -hmm. helps keep membership up. It also gets people to join in. If you're not a member of NAR, you don't get to be part of it. That would be a strategic play I would do. Um, and I hope I'm wrong, but I think the number is somewhere around $2 billion. Uh, with a B? With, with a, a B. B. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that plaintiff isn't going to let NAR off the hook because they represent the industry. And the plaintiff knows that the uh, that NAR could do a dues assessment. Mm -hmm. and could charge all of the industry that money versus trying to go after these companies that don't have a lot of assets right now. I think it's a couple billion, uh, maybe higher, depending upon how the terms go. And then it's paid out over the course of four years. So they, let's just hypothetically say there's 1.3 million realtors. They do a dues assessment to come up with the number. If it's $400 a year, $500 a year times four years, they pay out the money. And more importantly, we now move on. That move on is this. They open the class. Everybody in the U.S. can join. We take all the chips off the table as much as we can. Uh, and then essentially the industry gets behind this or it moves past this. Moves past this, yeah. Yeah, it moves past this. Um, it limits the fallout from all of the copycat lawsuits that are likely going to ensue shortly, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, because two companies settled that told every lawyer in the country, here's the exact cases you could do to file against everybody else. NAR is going to feel pressure if those lawsuits start to occur. You know, we get sued, others get sued. Uh, it starts to put pressure on them. They're the gatekeeper to getting this to go away. And this is more important. I think that, as I said, best case scenario, cooperation in the MLS is optional. Again, I do think it's an outright ban at some point. Um, and that settles that. Then we'll talk about, I think, momentarily how we go forward. But that's my that's the likely scenario I think will occur with this. So. In our opinion, most likely scenario, everyone settles. We get closure on this event and have the ability to move forward. Part of that moving forward will be uh, cooperation is no longer part of the MLS or part of the process. I think eventually, depending upon whether it's the cases or the FTC, cooperation in the MLS is over. Yeah. Okay. The MLS so, becomes a data repository and not a place to cooperate on compensation. Yeah. So what does that translate to then to the industry going forward? What's yeah. the next step? Once okay. that goes away, what happens in the industry? So this is where everybody needs to like really take notes. This is not the sky is falling. Everyone needs to calm down. There's no apocalypse here. Okay? Say it again. Say it again. The for sky the sky is around. not falling. Everybody <laughs> calm down for a yeah. second. Okay. Yeah. Number one, and this is where I'm going to advocate for NER. Everybody who's like pissed at NER for reasons that we all know, that's separate and apart from the fact this organization has a very strong purpose in lobbying. NER, I believe, is, and if not, will very shortly work with Fannie and Freddie to figure out ways that we can finance an agent's compensation into the loan. That's the first thing. They're that good is, at this shit. This is what cannot, they do. Yeah, to be clear, you cannot do that today. Um, it, it is not possible. But it does make sense that the two industries would get together and find their own solution for how to do this. Correct. Right? They're going to find ways to do this. They're going to they're going to figure out how to be able to do it with VA loans. And there's there's going to be changes. And this is exactly what NER's big structure is about. We've had Shannon McGann on this podcast. If you haven't mm -hmm. listened to that, go check out that episode. She's the one that does all the lobbying with all of the politicians. Um, they're going to figure out a way to do that. But that's not even the most important part. You have a really great use case in the Northwest MLS that's already been doing something like this since October of last year. They implemented the ability to have it optional in the MLS. There hasn't been much of a change. And this is the thing. When, when you sit down with a seller, this is what it will look like. So Mr. and Mrs. Seller, uh, last week, I would charge you X and then I would give part of that to the buyer's agent who's representing the buyer. The reason we did that, by the way, is because the buyer is going to be strapped for cash mm -hmm. there to afford the ridiculous real estate prices that you're about to benefit from. <laughs> uh, they, you know, you, it's always been this way. You're going to pay the compensation to the buyer's agent because the buyer's got a closing costs and all the stuff going on. We can't do it any other way. So Mr. And Mrs. Seller, this recently just changed. And so what you need to understand is I'm going to charge you for what I charge to represent you. You are going to expect in the purchase contract 
that when this when an offer comes across, it's going to have that you're going to pay whatever that fee is that the buyer's agent's requesting directly to them. So instead of it coming through me, you're going direct to them. I want to make sure you understand, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, this is pretty much how every offer coming across is going to be done. And if the buyer can't come up with the money themselves and you aren't willing to pay it, the deal will fall apart. And the seller is going to go, well, shit, I don't want to do that. Like I want to get my house <laughs> right. sold and I was already paying it anyway. Yeah. So you're just shifting money. It's yeah. removing it's a different this in conversation. a different conversation. Yeah. And on the buy side, super important. 12 states right now require buyer broker agreements. I think you'll see all 50. In fact, every association executive listening to this, start this now. Right now, figure out how to get buyer broker agreements in place at a statewide level. Two things. Number one is we establish fiduciary, which we need to be doing. The government wants that. They're not going to fight you on this. And number two, it levels the playing field. I want to be clear with my statement. If, if it's a requirement at the state level, we don't have to deal with, well, this agent didn't require it and this one does. <laughs> right. It just makes it easier for everyone. And more importantly, it benefits the consumer. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not only benefiting the buyer because they know who the hell's working for them, but it also benefits the seller because you don't have a bunch of looky-loos coming through the property. So there's just there's upside potential on this. That's the first thing. Um, I think dual agency becomes a topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. It's banned currently in nine states. I personally hope it's banned in all 50. I want to be clear with my statement. Dual agency meaning the same agent representing the buyer and the seller. You cannot have the same lawyer do it. We shouldn't do it either. Like That should be something that we discuss. But the point here is the way this will work, the buyer's agent's going to have the buyer sign a buyer broker agreement. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, this is what I'm worth. This is why this is what I do. Keith and I'll talk about that momentarily. Yep. And we're going to structure the contract. So the seller pays my fees directly. And if for any reason they don't, we will have, and this is my hope, NAR, wink, wink. We also have the ability to finance that compensation in the loan. So like everyone needs to just calm down for yeah. a second. And there's, yeah. there's a use case for this. We just have to retrain redevelop our negotiation stills and kind of go down a different road. And I'll make a really controversial statement. The outcome of cooperation ending in the MLS and me representing a buyer and the another person representing a seller establishes who's working for who. And our, our industry's done a really shitty job of like trying to establish fiduciary to be blunt. We've got sub agency and transaction broker and all this nonsense. Like it just needs to be very clearly who is what, but here's the best part, Keith. I know you'll love this. Mm -hmm. If I'm a buyer's agent, I'm no longer being dictated what I get paid because yep. the seller's agent was doing that before. Now I can sit down and explain directly to a buyer what I'm worth. This is what it is. Not that we couldn't do it before, but it's less convoluted. It's like, yeah. this is what I do. So, we could have done it before, but we didn't, right? At right. the most, again, unless you're one of those states that required a buyer broker conversation yeah. and a buyer broker agreement to be signed. At most, you were having some sort of exclusivity. I only work with clients who work exclusively with me. And that was sort of the alpha and omega of the conversation. Now you will have to have a much more formal conversation. And to your point, I think it's like once you get past the shock of change, right? Change is hard. None of us like it. I don't want to learn any new skills. I like it the way it is right now. Once you get past the shock of that and you realize, oh, when I sign this, like my buyers now can go out into the wild and not be poached. And oh, uh, I now can dictate the income that I'm going to earn from working with buyers. I'm not dependent on the negotiation skills of this listing yeah. agent, which may or may not be good. Our industry just gets more professional. And by the yeah. way, everywhere I go in circles, everyone talks about the lack of professionalism. Well, guess what? What's going to happen here is the bottom 30% <laughs> are going to go bye-bye. And like the agents that are good at what they do are going to get better. And I, yeah. and I just, I personally am like, we should do this stuff. This is the, this is a conversation we need to have. I have very little fear of this because I just look at it. Like we're going to sit down. We're going to have a presentation about what I do. We're going to talk very clearly about the process, the time, the energy, the activities, all the things that are involved in this, how much work goes on. And by the way, for agents on this, you guys would all agree with me. You spend more time with a buyer than you do a seller yet. You wouldn't do a listing without having a, a, an exclusive contract with them. Right. So, right. you know, this is a this is a growth opportunity from from that standpoint. And more importantly, if this ends up this way, which is what we think will happen, there's no more investigations. 
Right. We can put this chapter behind us and go back to mm-hmm. serving people at the highest level, which is yeah. what this industry is really best in yeah. the world at anyway. Yeah. 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 So let's unpack a little bit the different compensation methods. I know we've touched on them a little, uh, like you talked about the entry level price point. Uh, my personal opinion is, as you move up uh, the dollar, you know, the average sales price in your local market, whatever the top end is, you better be good at negotiating and you better brush up on those skills because there could be an expectation that the, that the buyer will pay their own commission because uh, they have the capital to do so, Right. So how do you see some of the different compensation methods? So I've had a lot of people talking about things that are just not accurate. So I keep hearing, well, our industry is going to become more like lawyers. I'm like, no, Um, actually the opposite. Um, I I have, I'm privy to some stuff I've been seeing that if you actually track what a realtor is doing and you track their time, if we did it hourly, they'd actually pay more than what they pay. (laughs) Um, Well, maybe that's actually a good thing. I don't know. But anyway, so I don't see that happening. Number two is the, the statute for, our carve out for independent contractor status that we have with the IRS specifically talks about the fact that you can't charge hourly. If you charged hourly, you have to become a W-2 employee inside the brokerage. So again, I don't really see that happening. What I do see happening, and I'm not saying this is going to be a massive thing. This has been around for a while anyway. And th- these these models actually struggle in the US. I can think of Purple Bricks or Foxen mm-hmm. as two companies that tried different models that fail, candidly filed bankruptcy here. Um, I think you'll see percentage as a thing that people do still and probably still the primary um i think you'll see a flat rate develop where it's i you know i charge a a flat rate for something and you know this is what i give you and then i think you might see a menu of services yeah which by the way this this, and this is what it costs this is what you've been seeing on the listing side right Right. this has been what's happening on the listing side so you're gonna see that now on the buyer side yeah not the end of the world, not no. nothing to panic about. And the thing <laughs> is, like, I think people underestimate. I had this on a call with some Wall Street guys I was talking to yesterday who I'm doing this similar thing for in a few weeks. And I said, I think people severely underestimate what people are willing to pay for convenience. Mm-hmm. I think people severely underestimate that in American culture. Yeah, look at, if, look at DoorDash. You get like a $40 cheeseburger, but you don't have to get off your couch. Uh, right? Exactly. <laughs> like people like pay a lot of money to not yeah. have to get in the car to go do stuff. I, I genuinely think people underestimate how much people value convenience. And so why I do not think flat rate and menu based items are going to take off mm-hmm. is I hate that shit because it's <laughs> like, well... I get, you know, it's like you go to an all-inclusive resort, like you, for example, you go to an all-inclusive resort and it's like, well, you can have this, but you can't have that. Well, what does that cost? Right. Like, no, just, just give me a damn rate. Just give me, I just want it all for like, I don't want to deal with the minutia and I don't think I'm unique in that thought process. So I still sit in the camp of you've got mom and dad who have to work anymore to have a living in the United States. If you've got kids, your life is just, I have a two and a half year old, like, oh my Chaos. God. Yeah. Right. Who the hell has the time to go deal with like the minutia of all the things I don't get when buying a house? I want to pay somebody something. I want it to be dealt with. I want to tell me what I'm signing, move on with my day. So I don't think there's going to be this massive shift. And I think you'll see some of this pop up, but I still think the majority will be done the way it currently is today. I think the where you will see a massive shift is in this, is in the skill set that will be required and the agents that develop it and level up will well, capture market share. 100%. And the ones who don't will fail. 100%. And so with that in mind, this will be sort of what we'll close on for this episode. All right. So we've talked about what we think is going to happen. We've talked about all of the, the different components. What should, if you're listening to this and you're in the real estate industry, what should people be doing working on leveling up today? What skills should they be getting better at? What what conversation should they be practicing? What should I do to get better at the craft to prepare me for the other side? Yeah. So the first thing I'll start with brokers and then we'll go to agents okay. um, or brokers or franchise or that yeah. matter. Business Educate owner. your damn people. Please okay? get send them, them this pod. <laughs> send just them, send the, them pod. the pod. I don't care. Like we're, we're sharing <laughs> yeah. with you the stuff we're doing. Like the yeah. whole point of this is to get, we don't win if the industry doesn't come together and win too. Okay. Correct. So you got to start leading from the top. Educate people on what this is and what the potential outcomes could be. By the way, if we're wrong and NER wins, great. Celebrate because Perfect. you just got better anyway at your profession. Like we trained people how to be better negotiators and articulate value. Mm-hmm. So start with talking about it 
informing people, educating them, lead on what this is, give them the insights on it. We hope this pod will have helped with that. Mm -hmm. Number two is you should start implementing buyer broker agreements anyway. 12 states require it, 38 don't. Do it as it is. And not, by the way, at the close of the, right, right when you're right to write an offer, make it so <laughs> right. that's like when you meet with a client, you explain very clearly what it is that you do. And in order to have my time, I need in a commitment back from you. That's the conversation. So that should be just started right now. Do and lots of training on it. You just know? to add a piece, if you aren't willing to go all the way to implementing it, at least start training on it. At Talk least about start it. practicing it. At least print the damn thing. Yes, I said print because I'm 52. Yeah. But like have it in front of you and read it a hundred times yeah. so that you know how to explain it and talk about it. Yes, at the end, it will be different because there'll be a new buyer broker agreement that'll be written for every state across the country on the other side of all this. Yeah. But they're going to use whatever they have existing as the template and then add, tweak, or change. Yes. Get comfortable with talking about buyer broker agency at a yeah. minimum develop that skill yep number two uh do a buyer presentation treat a buyer the same as you would a seller yep. sit down explain what you do we did that we put it the 155 things an agent does on an average deal like go out and start articulating your value like mm -hmm. explain to them the amount of work that's involved if we don't just open doors and write a contract it's so much more than that Get very good at sitting down with people, role play it. I don't care what you do, but get comfortable sitting down, talking about your services, deal with objection, learn to overcome those objections, sit down on every single buyer. And so we're going to sit down and talk about what I do. And here's a presentation. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to email it to you, make it digital, print it like Keith does. I don't give a crap what it is, but <laughs> get a presentation in place. And then you've got your buyer broker agreement to talk about exclusivity. Those two things need to happen right now, take that deeper, get it on your website. Why is the importance of a buyer's agent? What it is that we do different? What are the risks without with buying a property without having representation? All of these things that you guys do and you know should be very clearly articulated to a consumer. And by the way, we just were looking at some studies, 1000 Watt, giving a shout out to Brian Bowero. There's mm -hmm. a great study on you know what buyers are looking for. They don't know how you're actually being compensated. And candidly, one of the things that we realize they don't actually care. Yeah. They just want somebody to take care of this stuff. So stop having such lack of confidence and articulate your value to them. Yep. Um, the only other the... piece I would add to that yeah. list, and we had figure out buyer broker, get comfortable with it, read about it, talk about it, get good at it, buyer presentation. You need to level up that skill. Historically, the buyer presentation has been sort of this fun visioneering exercise. Yeah. And then you take them out and look at pretty houses. Uh, you're going to have to have a more substantive conversation in your buyer presentation. The last one that I would be leveling up hard is my negotiation skills. Totally. I, you, you are going to be negotiating more for the buy side of the commission. That will be a reality. You're going to have to get comfortable having a negotiation type conversation with the seller's agent, with the buyer, with people in the process. So go... Uh, go get Never Split the Difference or your favorite book on negotiation. Uh, start training and working on your negotiation skills and level them up because they've always been important, but they're going to be exponentially more important on the other side of this event. Uh, those three things are the key. I mean, there's a lot more to it, but those sure. are basically the, 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 the pieces that everyone <clears throat> needs to get good at. And the, and the brokers, you got to start training your people on this stuff. And agents... Just start treating it like a listing. You're, you you want to perfect that. You all are excited about doing that. Perfect your buy side as well. Mm -hmm. I promise you this. So we had a couple of our people that were on our stage recently, and they talked about how it was it like eighty eight percent of the time they get their buyer to sign the buyer broker agreement, not required in their state, by the way. Yeah. And and it was a really interesting conversation because they're like, <laughs> well, I just explain what I do, and like mm -hmm. they kind of were just kind of weird that nobody else is doing it. They're like, I just explain what I do. How if you want me to spend my time with you, then I want an exclusive relationship with you. I'm not going to go do all this work without you committing to me if I'm committing to you. It's almost like common sense. Mm -hmm. And the comment I wanted to make, a, I think it's really important, is one of them goes, one of the reasons why I have a lot less issues is because I'm really good at working my sphere. I don't have to sit down and explain my value to my mm -hmm. sphere because they all know who I am anyway. And it was right. just a it's a little bit of a thing there of like work your sphere, really understand who your people are, 
those conversations will be less of, they'll have a lot less objection than some yeah. random lead you get off realtor.com or Zillow or something else. So. Trust, trust speeds up all business cycles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so absolutely. All right. So just to put a bow on this, cause I think we're at like 45 minutes. Or yeah. So, whatever. But yeah, yeah. That's good. So just to put a bow on this world's not ending. Correct. Things will change. Yes. Probably sooner than you think. Yes. Please shout it from the mountaintops to anyone who will listen. Send and, this. Yeah. Send the this. We did it. Share Steal, it. Look, if you're, look, I'll say it. If you're an owner out there right now and you want to just play this a hundred times and scribble down your own notes and deliver it like it's yours, Go have at it. it. We don't yeah. care. Yeah. The industry has to be preparing for what's on the other side. The best analogy I have, and trust me, if you could see the full body of, of the of my voice i'm not built for running track okay i've never run track in my life i could probably throw the shit out of a shot put but i've never run track that is true yeah. but when the gun goes off some people are going to be coming out of the starters blocks and some other people are already going to be at a dead sprint i promise you the people who have put in the work and developed the skills they're going to be the ones that are already running when the gun goes off they don't have to get up to speed you have an opportunity here for you and for your business, whoever you are that's hearing this, you have an opportunity to get ahead of the curve, position your business or your company in the right place so that when this change happens, you don't miss a beat. Yeah. A lot of the industry will miss a beat and you can capture market share at that time. Yeah. And I, the comment I want to add on this, I've been watching all these posts on Facebook, people like these cases are stupid and like, I don't understand. And it's a government conspiracy, yeah, whatever. Like sure, the reality maybe. is fine. <laughs> It doesn't matter. This is coming. And so the point here is get over that and just start planning around what we believe we're mm -hmm. giving you the direction this is going to go. And there may be variances and we may be off on sure. a few things, but no, we are off the on key things, point, but yeah. this change is coming in some way, shape or form. And we've mm -hmm. given you the foundation of what we gave you is what you should be doing right now because Agreed. you'll be much better prepared if, and when this does. So there you go, kids. All right. That's all we got on That's this it, topic. Kiddos. Bye everybody. It's our job to say out loud what everybody's only thinking to themselves. It's your job to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode.